as I've said many times before, um, we're keen to see the world in or through rose tinted spectacles, to see it as a nice place, and maybe even to have a positive attitude towards pe <laughs> towards people, which is a total folly. But um, we're inclined to do those things. Why? Well, because it um, is survival enhancing to have those thoughts. We don't think that the world is not a nice place and that people are generally um, all against all, to use the term of Hobbes. And in fact, I've got a couple of quotes from Hobbes, one from Spinoza, one from Thomas Schelling, um, to try and illustrate the points. The reality is, uh, I, c I could have quoted endless numbers of people, Leopardi, um, Pessoa, Nietzsche. Anyway, I've got three or four quotes from just a few people. The reality is that conflict is everywhere. Now, <laughs> you can take a number of different views on this. One is you can take the view that, well, one day it will be fixed. It won't. You can take the view that, well, there is conflict and it's a bad thing. Nietzsche wouldn't agree with that. Nietzsche seems to think, and he's got a point, that conflict adds spice to life, basically. And some people are very good at it, and winning in situations where there, there's conflict and, and other people are not. But conflict is everywhere, and it's the norm. We don't like to think in those terms for the reasons I've just said. That it makes the world seem not a particularly safe or desirable place. It's better to think in terms of, well, the world is really a nice place and there are nasty things going on, but they are the exception. They're not the exception, they are the rule. I've had a couple of guys this morning rip me off. Not for a huge amount of money, but for enough to um, make sure I never want to see them again. Um, it's the way it is. He's just ordinary guys trying to carve out a living come to my house, do some fairly banal things uh, with the air conditioning, and then present me with a bill that's off the face of the earth. It's just outrageous. I just wanted to get them out of the place. So I gave them their money. They had the cheek to say, and we can do this, and we can do that. I said, bye. Anyway, this is the normal way things are in life. Everybody will rip everybody else off if they can. Everybody will try and take advantage of other people, exploit them in some way. There's always conflict. It's the name of the game. Life becomes much, much easier if you can accept these things and not fight against them. It's our instinct to fight against them because we don't want the world to be a nasty place, but it is. And in Nietzsche's view, well, the nastiness kind of as to the flavour of it all. Um, anyway, uh, Hobbes and Spinoza, and I think I mentioned before that Spinoza was very, very influenced by Hobbes. Hobbes Thomas Hobbes wrote uh, Leviathan, uh, which is basically about how to set up a, um, a ruling body a commonwealth, the Leviathan. And uh, Spinoza is well taken with this, and in fact if you read, well in certain parts of the ethics, and I've got an example to show you of Spinoza pretty much lifting out of Hobbes. Um, 
but you know Hobbes just saw the whole thing as and Spinoza as dog eat dog now Hobbes says it very openly Spinoza tries to put ribbons around it but his central message is the same so um, I've got quotes from Hobbes and Spinoza uh, if and Hobbes's main point is that conflict and war are natural. In fact, Kant had something to say about that, which I'll mention in a moment. Conflict and war are natural, and we need a ruling authority to make sure that we're not all bashing each other's brains out, and to make sure that society can move forward in some kind of way. I mean, you can imagine if there was no ruling authority, what would be the benefit of ploughing a bit of land when some marauding mob could come and just steal what you've grown or you know whatever any any kind of effort if some kind of mob could come and just steal it there'd be no point making any effort whatsoever so we need a ruling authority we'd still be in caves beating each other's brains out if um <laughs> if uh, the ruling authorities had, had not um, had not become part of the picture. So Hobbes thinks that war is a natural state, as is conflict. And Kant said something interesting about war. He said that war is simply an evolutionary force which establishes those regimes which are the strongest. Well, you can't really argue with that. I mean, Hitler's regime in the Second World War clearly wasn't the strongest. It was overcome. Uh, the United States has done pretty well. You know, they are still the uh, ruling authority on the planet, really, although maybe not for a lot longer. But uh, So that particular regime reasonable amounts of personal freedom for the population and uh, very big rewards for the people who can rip the whole thing off seems to work quite well so Kant's uh, statement seems to make sense it's just evolutionary forces and that's what wars are I mean Kant would say something like that he was fairly what's the word uh, I don't think he had a lot of empathy, actually. <laughs> of the, uh, actually, I just need to set this up. Uh, of the um, the um, Lisbon earthquake in seventeen something or other, I think it was. Uh, all the other philosophers were saying, "Well, you know, this is terrible. There can't be a god." It actually shook a lot of people. That hundreds of thousands of people died in the earthquake and um, the tsunami that followed. Uh, but for Kant it was just, oh well, you know, it's just a slippage of the earth's plates or something. <laughs> he had no real empathy for the people that um, had died in that. So, um, you should know that these days game theory assumes that there's going to be conflict. It assumes that people are going to lie and cheat and steal. And game theory has proved to be very, very useful in devising strategies, assuming that everyone's going to lie and steal and cheat and so on. Um, the oil cartels use it because they can't trust each other. So the, you know each cartel member devises a strategy based on well the other, all the others are lying bastards so you know how am I going to cope with that? So let me go to uh, a few slides just to illustrate these points. So the central idea is that conflict is normal according to Kant. It's an evolutionary force and you can't really argue with that. Um, and that the whole 
love and light thing which religion has tried to impose on us has achieved nothing. If you get involved with any so-called spiritual groups, and I got involved with a few, probably four or five, you'll find the same old conflicts, the same old um, struggles for power. It's all the same. <laughs> doesn't matter what fancy wrapping you put on it. Anyway, just let me quote uh, Thomas Schelling first of all. His book, Strategy of Conflict, is a brilliant book. I mean, it's quite old now, but... Um, he did a lot of work on the Cold War and strategies for trying to deal with it. Anyway, I've quoted this before, but it says it all really. Among diverse theories of conflict, corresponding to the diverse meanings of the word conflict, a main dividing line is between those that treat conflict as a pathological state, which is almost everybody. You know, one day there will be peace on earth, there won't. Conflict is a natural state, it's an evolutionary force in truth. Uh, a main dividing line is between those who, that treat conflict as a pathological state and key, seek its causes and treatment, and those that take conflict for granted and study the behaviour associated with it. And that is the route we take here, or at least the route I take. Conflict is a given. Let's try and understand it. Not to try and cure it, but for our own true advantage to use Spinoza's words. I'd recommend that book if you want a kind of uh, treatment of game theory without equations. It's, um, it's a great book. Right, now let's get onto this slide where you can see quite clearly how Spinoza has lifted out of Hobbes. So Hobbes says, uh, if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. And in the way to their end, which is principal, principally their own conservation and sometimes their delectation, only endeavour to destroy or subdue one another. Now Hobbes calls it out, Spinoza doesn't. Hobbes says that if two people are after the same thing, they will do almost anything to make sure that they get that thing. And in Hobbes' fairly uh, uncensored words, says they would endeavour to destroy or subdue one another. So, basically two people after the same thing. So what does Spinoza say? If we think that someone enjoys something that only one person can possess, we shall endeavour to bring it about that he should not possess that thing, but Spinoza doesn't go into, well, we might destroy them or subdue them in some way. Well, how else are you going to get it unless you subdue them in some kind of way? So, um, you can see how, uh, there are many examples actually in Leviathan, um, where you can see that Spinoza just lifted stuff out of it. So let's have a look at the last uh, quotation from uh, Hobbes. Leviathan, a lot of it is, for me, not particularly relevant because he talks in great de detail about formation of a, um, a state, a commonwealth. Uh, I'm more interested in the, um, the psychology, the individual psychology of it all. But he does have a quite large section on man, and that's the interesting bit. Men have no pleasure, but on the contrary, a great deal of grief in keeping company. As I say, he just calls it out. Where there is, n now this is important, where there is no power able to overawe them all, in other words, if you just get a group of people together who think they are each other's peers, you're in for trouble. If, however, in that group there is one person that everybody thinks in some way is stronger, more powerful than they are, 
they will all act in a kind of subservient manner, and it all becomes a bit more orderly. Anyway, men have no pleasure, but on the contrary a great deal of grief in keeping company, where there is no power able to overawe over all them all. For every man looketh that his companion should value him. At the same rate he sets upon himself. So everybody in, you know, some little group of people thinks that he should be the main character. And upon all signs of contempt or undervaluing, naturally endeavours as far as he dares, which amongst them that have no common power to keep them in quiet, is far enough to make them destroy each other. He dares to exhort a greater value from those who show contempt by harm, and from others by the example. So you either impress people, or if people are not impressed or trying to diminish you in some way, then maybe you harm them. It doesn't have to be physical. You can just deride them in some kind of way or humiliate them or whatever. But this is a great thing about Hobbes. He just calls it out. He doesn't really add any uh, flourishes in the same way that uh, Spinoza does. So, to get back to the main message... Conflict is everywhere. Please don't treat it as though it's an exception. Please don't treat being ripped off by somebody as an exception. <laughs> like I was this morning. Um, please don't treat um, hostility and all those things as exceptions. They're not. They're the norm. And it's, you know, so you got two levels, well you've got a number of levels really, on the personal level you've got one set of people trying to establish their superiority over another set of people or an individual. Uh, at a national level you've got regimes, governments trying to assert their authority over other governments and, they, and regimes maybe. It's an evolutionary force to see who, what um, is the strongest thing. And it's perfectly normal. To go back to that um, quote of Schelling's, um, a main dividing line between those that treat conflict as a pathological state. It isn't a pathological state. All of game theory, all the reasoning that goes on now assumes that people are uh, lying stealing and cheating individuals or organizations like that and even though that you know even though people and organizations are treated like that you can still figure out um, the best way to deal with the situation I had a very intense situation like that uh, 20 years ago now and happily enough I knew enough game theory to work out what I should do based on the fact that the people around me were lying and cheating and trying to steal. And my strategy worked, fortunately. I might not be doing this if it didn't. Anyway, you don't have to pretend that people are your friends, that they like you, or anything like that. It is truly all against all. And that is the basic rule you should use in um, navigating your way through life.